Hey, listen, uh, we are going to finish out uh, a series that we've been in for a few weeks. This is the last one. This is it. The last hurrah, the last shebang, all right? So uh, does anybody, before they put the slot up, does anybody remember the name of the series that we've been in? Influencers, Influencers right? Yeah. And we've, brought, we've gotten through parts one, two, and three. So I'm going to kind of recap what, has we, what have we talked about up to uh, this point. In part one was all about how uh, there are things in life that influence us. Typically, those things are negative influences in our life. That we believe as Christians that God has called us to be agents of change in our community. That God has called us to compel and convince people of truth and the gospel. But the reality is that the way that we are influenced will determine how we go out and are a change uh, in our community and how we go out and compel and convince people of the gospel. We have to first realize, what is it that influences me? So in part one, we talked all about that. What are the things that influence me, the things that I watch, the things I listen to, the people that I hang around? Those are all things that influence us. And that's kind of how we finished out part one. And in part two, we looked at, man, what are the things in life that we can say, hey, these things are typically not good, but what good can I get out of them? How can I redeem these negative influences uh, in my life? And remember we talked about how Judas lived under the teachings of Jesus, but he didn't let it change him. And I think there are things in our life that we can be on social media, we can be around people, we can be around our family, and there could be some good to come out of that, but we don't allow that to happen. We don't embrace that, we don't encourage it, uh, and so, so we want to redeem those things. We want to not be someone who lives in a basement for the rest of our life with no contact with humans uh, of the outer worlds. We want to be people who are actually with people and on social media and do watch movies and listen to podcasts and are with people. But we want to use those things for good. We want to redeem them so that ultimately God is our primary influence in life. And so last week we looked at part three of our influencer series. And that was all about, does anybody remember the question, the big question from last week? This is kind of a tough, qu- a tough question for you to answer, but does anybody remember the question? What blank has God given me? Do you remember what I, what I said? What platform? Yeah, what platform has God given me? Is that platform social media? Is that platform of uh, the particular spot that I hold in my family? Is that platform the people that I play games with on the internet or the people that I'm on a sports team with? What kind of area or thing has God gifted me with and how can I use that? to influence people for him. Ultimately, God is entrusted. He's gifted all of us with some area of influence, whether you feel like you're insignificant or not. I promise you, God has gifted you with an area that you have the ability to influence people. And it's all a matter of, are we going to use that? Are we going to embrace this lifestyle of influence that God has challenged us to? So we're looking at part four, and we're going to continue looking at the, not the beginning where how am I being influenced, but we're continuing to look at how can I be an influencer? Uh, one of the things uh, I thought about with this um, is this idea of love. Everybody say love. Uh, I celebrated something pretty unique this year. I celebrated 10 years of marriage. Yeah. Is there anybody, what's the, who's the youngest person? Is there anybody who's 11 years old? 11? Yeah, 11 years old. So like I've been married like almost as long as you've been alive, right? Isn't that crazy? That is like wild, okay? That it makes me feel really old. But anyways, uh, so I celebrated 10 years of marriage this year. And uh, I thought about how things have changed over the past 10 years between uh, my wife, Johanna. I don't know if you ever met my wife before, but my wife, Johanna, and I. I remember that when we first got married, the way that I would show my wife that I loved her was uh, she would come home from work, and the house would be like spotless. Like I would clean the whole house, upstairs, downstairs. I would clean the living room, the kit, the dishes would be done, the bathtub would be scrubbed, everything in the house. I would clean the whole house, and Johanna would come home from work. She worked at a grocery store at the time, and she would just be like, the house is like so clean. It smells so good. This is like amazing. Thank you so much for cleaning uh, the house for me. I remember uh, I used to always stop by and get flowers, like on my way home from work, and I would give her flowers when I get home. That's one way uh, that I show her that I love her. But now I have kids. You guys have maybe seen my kids around here uh, from time to time. I have three kids. One of the ways that I show my wife that I love her now is when it comes time for bed, every now and then I'll say, hey, Joe, 
that's what I call my wife. I know it's kind of a guy's name, but I call her Joe. Hey, Joe, I'll take care of the kids tonight. I'll brush their teeth. I'll put their pajamas on. I'll tuck them in the bed. One of my kids literally never goes to bed on, like, she always, like, screams and asks for, like, a snack or water or whatever she wants to scream for at the night. And I said, I got this one. You sit on the couch. You go sit in the hot tub. Whatever you want to do. Like, this is you time, all right? And I'm going to go take care of the kids. And that's one way now that I show my wife, hey, I love you. In, in the Bible, Jesus tells us how we can show him that we love him. This passage has actually come up several times over the past week, and it was like God just like flicking me in the forehead. Hey, hey, pay attention, pay attention. And it says in John 15, John 14, chapter 15, John, oh my gosh, John 14, chapter 15, if you love me, my commandments, all right? So I show my wife, hey, I love you, and because I love you, I'm going to put the kids to bed by myself tonight. You take the night off. Jesus says, if you love me, put your kids to bed. No, that's not what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Abide in him. It's kind of the series we're actually teeing up that we'll start next week. But it's all about keeping God's commandments. So what commandment has God given us? I've challenged you in this series that ultimately God has commanded us to be people of influence, to be people of change, to be people who compel and convince. That's what God has called every. But there is one kind of command and kind of commission that God, like Jesus kind of gives the church, gives to every Christian. And it comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, saying it has been given to Jesus. Jesus says, Go therefore and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There it is again. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus commands his disciples, the people who had been following him and learning from him, he commands them, hey, go out and make disciples. And the same mission, the same command is true for us today, that ultimately God has commanded us to go and to make disciples And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now listen, there's a lot of other commandments that Jesus has given them. But at least we, looking at this one, we can obey this one and show Jesus that we love him, that we take our relationship with him seriously. Now listen, I understand that that word disciple is not a word that we use all the time. Maybe you've never used that word. Uh, How many of you ever used the word discipline? It's kind of a similar word where we get that idea from, being disciplined or being discipled, a disciple of. But I want us to look for a second at what is a disciple, all right? What is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who has a, like, mentor or an influencer, a teacher in their life, somebody who is, is actively being, being taught something, being crafted uh, into something good, all right? That is a disciple. They have a mentor, an influencer, a teacher, Now, I'm kind of narrowing down uh, what a disciple is uh, right now, but one of the things uh, that I think of whenever we think about a disciple in today's world is uh, somebody who is in that one-on-one kind of relationship with somebody, like a a mentoring-type relationship. Like Jesus and Peter would hang out, and Jesus would teach Peter things. Now, we know ultimately how many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve of them, right? But Jesus was like... Next level, okay? Like, we might be able to get to that point, but I think uh, having a disciple is somebody who's, like, man, connecting uh, with uh, someone who's a teacher, a mentor uh, in their life. The third one is this, is someone that has Christ at the focus of their life. So when we think of the word uh, mentor, influencer, or teacher, how many of you guys ever, like, learned a sport and somebody taught you how to do that sport? Somebody this past winter, somebody taught me how to ski. I'd never skied before because... I ain't from around here, and uh, so we don't do skiing where I'm from. And so somebody taught me how to ski. They mentored me into being a good skier. I'm not a good skier, but I wanted to be, and so I skied for a couple of days. Uh, but listen, when we think about a disciple, this is someone who's not just trying to be a better person, not someone who's just trying to learn a skill or to do a thing. It's all about, about being more like Christ, Christ at the focus of their life. That's what a disciple is. 
There's number four, but we're going to come back to that one later. So kind of put a bookmark there. We're going to come back to number four at a later time. So we talk about a disciple, all right? We think about Jesus had disciples, and they lived with Jesus, and Jesus taught them things, and then ultimately left, and the disciples said, hey, we're going to go out, and we're going to make more disciples. And we see that, but that's kind of weird for us, right? Like, could you imagine, like, as a, like a 12 or 13-year-old kid saying, mom, I'm out, I'm going to go live with this dude, and uh, he's going to teach me a bunch of stuff about, like, how to be a Christian, so, like, mom, I'll see you in a few years. Peace out, right? That's really weird. That would, like, literally never happen. If it did, like, we'd have to call the police or something because that's really creepy, okay? But that's how it worked for Jesus' time. So I want to talk a little bit about what does that relationship look like uh, in our world today. If God has, is calling us to make disciples but also to be a disciple, what does that look like for us? How do we make that function Uh, in our society today. So what does that relationship look like between a disciple and someone who's mentoring them, or a disciple and a teacher, a disciple and for the sake of the series, an influencer, all right? The first idea that I thought about was this idea of accountability. So when you think about, man, somebody is mentoring me, or I'm mentoring someone else, there's this idea that we hold them accountable. There's a that I think God has called all of us to, and sometimes we need somebody in our life to like kick us a little bit and say, hey, don't do that. Or like, hey, you said that you struggle with that. I'm going to actually like hold you to it. Like when you mess up, when you fail, when you act out in anger, when you do something that is wrong, a sin, I want you to text me and tell me. I think there's this level of accountability. Right now, I have a guy that I meet up with. His name is Ryan. And Ryan and I meet once a month, and I talk to Ryan, and I tell Ryan, hey, bro, these are the things that I really struggle with. These are the things that I, like, find the biggest temptations in my life, and these are the areas that I fail the most. Could you pray for me? Could you text me and check in on me? Could you hold me accountable to those things? In the same way, we, we talk about things like, like Ryan shared with me, hey, I really feel called to, like, be more intentional about telling my coworkers about Jesus, he doesn't work at a church like I do, and I still tell all my coworkers about Jesus. I've been trying to witness to Alex for months now, but he says, hey, I want to talk to my coworkers about Jesus. And so I text him, hey, Ryan, dude, how's that going? Have you been able to have any good conversations? You said that God's calling you to do that. Hey, like, don't let that slide. Don't let that go under the radar. Like, actually follow through. There's a sense of accountability, and we saw that Jesus did that with his disciples. He held them to a standard of, hey, This is what's right. This is what's good. Let's follow through. Let's actually do that. I think there's a second thing uh, about that relationship that Jesus did with his disciples, and it it works with us too, is that there's a sense of pursuing holiness, all right? Pursuing to be more like Christ. When I think about this in in a discipleship relationship, I think about this idea that we learn about the Bible together, and we talk about our faith together and we talk about what does it mean to really follow Jesus and what does it mean uh, to really know more about God. We talk about those things. Uh, Probably like seven years ago now, uh, there was these two two guys. One's name was Ryan. It's a different Ryan and another guy named uh, Jacob. And they were eighth graders uh, at a church that I worked at uh, before here. And they came up to me and I talked to them and we got to know each other a little better. And I asked them, I said, hey, can I mentor you? Can I, like, disciple you? Can I help you really craft together what God has gifted you with so that ultimately you can go out and tell more people about Jesus and disciple and mentor other people, even kids that are in middle school? And they did. And so I met up with them, and I said, hey, what's the thing that you, you struggle with the most? Or what's the thing that you don't know about God that you really want to know more about God? And so they told me. And so we sat down, and, hey, once a week we met up, and we went through Uh, a book together. We talked about the Lord. We talked about maybe what we had read uh, in our quiet time, how the Lord was working in our life. And we talked about, hey, this is what the Bible says about God. This is how you can know more about God. Jesus did the same thing with his disciples. Oftentimes, Jesus was was like uh, very, when we read the passages, like Jesus was very like blatant with things. And the disciples were like, I have no idea what Jesus just said. He's talking about water or something. And uh, Jesus was always teaching them and showing them and telling them, hey, this is who God is. This is what God is like. This is what God is calling you and telling you to do. So in the, in the, in the realm of that, we want to look 
we help each other pursue holiness? How can I teach somebody, man, this is what God is doing in my life, and I want to teach them the same things. There's a third step of this, and this is idea of reproduction, all right? Jesus, whoa, big brain, all right? Jesus, how long was Jesus on earth uh, and, dis- and kind of working with his disciples? Does anybody want to throw out a roundabout number? He was on earth for 33 years. At, how old was Jesus when he started his ministry? 30, all right? So how long was Jesus with the disciples? Do the math, quick math. Three years, all right? Jesus hung out with the disciples for a few years. He taught them about God. He taught them how to live life. He probably taught them a lot of other things too, like just natural skills of life. But ultimately, he was saying, hey, I am God, and this is how you should be more like me. Let's work on those things. And then ultimately, Jesus, right after he reads, after he says Matthew chapter 28 to his disciples, what does Jesus do? Yeah, peace out. I'm out of here. See you guys later. Hey, listen, the thing that I just did with you, you go do that to other people. I made disciples out of you. Now I want you to go out and make disciples. And that is the same thing that Jesus is calling us to do, to reproduce that. The Bible has uh, there's a, a teaching of Jesus about the soil, about how when a farmer plants soil, uh, or plants seed in good soil, that it doesn't just, one seed doesn't just reproduce one seed, and that's it. And then that one seed reproduces one seed. We would literally run out of food, because <laughs> that's just how it works, all right? There's a limited number of seeds. But that one seed, when planted, will reproduce 30 or 60 or 90 fold. That there is a, a, a sense of reproduction. That God has called us not to just be a Christian, but to also make more Christians, to make more disciples uh, of him. So we look at this verse, Matthew 28. It says, uh, go therefore and make disciples. All right, go there. Say it with me. Go therefore and make disciples. Listen, when we think of a, a task like that, like if I were to say, hey, hey you, go down to the store and get me a gallon of milk. I'm thirsty. It's kind of weird. I don't drink milk. Hey, go put some gas in my car. Hey, Go to the post office and send off this letter. We think of that as an action, right? That word go is very limited uh, in our society today. I've heard a couple other pastors talk about this idea of go therefore and make disciples. And it really reads more like this. As you are going, make disciples. As you are going to school, make disciples. As you go to track practice on Tuesday morning, make disciples. As you go... Uh, to play Xbox, make disciples. As you go to midweek, make disciples. As you go, everywhere that you are going, you need to have that in your mind. Make disciples. That's what Christ has commanded me to do. That's what I'm going to do is I'm going to make disciples. Now, I, the thing that I understand is I'm also talking to a room of middle schoolers. And in reality, you're like, Alan, how am I going to go make disciples? disciples when I have yet to like figure this thing out for myself. First off, I think you really don't put enough weight on yourself. I think you could totally do this. I think that as a seventh grader, an eighth grader, even a sixth grader, that there are people in your life that know less about God than you, who have been in a relationship with God for far less time than you, and you can mentor them. You're like, no, 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 Alan, maybe when I graduate high school, Maybe when I get out of college, maybe when I get a real job, then I'll think about maybe coming back and serving here at church on Wednesday night like our adult leaders do. Then I'll think about, man, how can I mentor somebody? And I think that's a really skewed way of looking at it. Like right now, God has said, as you are going to school as a middle schooler, make disciples. As you do the things that you do, make disciples. So there's there's kind of two sides of this. There's a sense of, all right, God is making me into a disciple, someone who follows him. And maybe there's a person in my life who crafts that in me, just as I have Ryan in my life right now who is mentoring me and shaping me to be more like Christ. So there's a sense of I am being a disciple, but then there's also that sense of I am making a disciple. Uh, When I was growing up, 
there's a, my youth pastor, his name was Jeremy. I'm going to show you a really embarrassing photo of me to help stick this in your brain. Uh, does anyone know which person up there is me? You want to just yell it out? I'm looking mad sketchy, bro. Which one? Which one? Over there, the yellow shirt. The white shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The white shirt. The guy with the bracelets. The guy with the bracelets. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, there I am in the back row, all the way to the left. I look really creepy. I've always looked like that, all right? And I'm wearing straight up pants out of Goodwill. I think they're like women's pants, actually. Yeah. Hang loose. Uh, and then I used to also wear about 45 of those like rubber bracelets. I was a weird kid. I'm telling you, I was a weirdo. Like no doubt, I got picked on. I was a weird kid, okay? And I embraced it. I was like, let's do this. Now that guy beside me, the dude with the blonde tipped hair, <laughs> he's also weird. That's my youth pastor. His name is Jeremy. Everybody say, hey, Jeremy. Yeah, and Jeremy, he taught me something. He was a guy who I think mentored me uh, for a long time, and I would still call him for advice from time to time. But Jeremy taught me something, and it's something that stuck with me for a long time, and he didn't come up with it. He probably heard it from somebody else. But listen to what Jeremy taught me that stuck with me. Listen, listen. Jeremy said, at every point in time, Somebody should be pouring into you, and you should be pouring in to someone else. At every point in your life, whether you're 80 years old or you're 80 years old, at every point in your life, somebody should be investing and developing and pouring into you. Pouring in was the phrase that he always used. And you should also be pouring in to someone else. At every point in life, as a college student, as a middle school student, as someone who's retired, living it up in the Caribbean, all right? At every point in life, you should have someone pouring into you, and you should be pouring into someone else. And that is something that has stuck with me for a really long time. And I don't think it's just like a phrase that you can like, yeah, cool words, bro. Like, it, it's a lifestyle. It's a sense that as Christians, God has called us to this model of his church, that we create disciples and that we are being disciples. This sense of just, that is just the way that we should think about and live life. Someone asked me today on social media, what's a book that changed your life? And I said, other than the Bible, because I'm one of those guys, you know. Other than the Bible, there's a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism by Robert Coleman. And literally outlines, this is how Jesus did ministry, this is how we should do ministry. And it's changed my life because of this idea that at every point in life, Someone should be pouring into you, and you should be pouring into someone else. And this is this idea of discipleship. I remember for Jeremy and I, uh, we, I was in his youth group for a, quite a while, but I remember one night, I drove to his house at like 11 o'clock at night, and I sat in his living room, and I was like half crying, and I said, Jeremy, I just really need somebody to mentor me. I need to, what did it sound like? <laughs> do you want to do it again? Oh, nice, nice, nice. It looks like you have a lot of practice with that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that, though. I remember sounding like that, a middle school boy crying. Had a lot of practice as a middle school boy crying, too. <laughs> and I sat in Jeremy's living room. I said, Jeremy, will you mentor me? Will you disciple me? Will you craft in me the gifts that God's given me? Will you hold me accountable Will you help me be a better Christian? And Jeremy was like, yes, I would love to do that. We should do that. And honestly, he had already been doing that. But I remember I was the one who kind of popped the question, who kind of asked him, invited him. And I think that there is power in that question. There's power in that question. Jesus did something similar with his disciples. Right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he had just been baptized by John the Baptist. He's chilling out. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee. Let's look at what Jesus did with his disciples, his first disciples. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, as Jesus was going, as he was doing his thing, maybe he was fishing, maybe he was collecting seashells, maybe he was just hanging out, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers 
of men. It says immediately they left their nets and followed him. See, Jesus poses this question. Really, it's a statement. It's not actually a question, but it's this, this proposition to the disciples. Hey, I see you guys are fishing for fish. That's a cool story, bro. Hey, if you come over here and if you follow me and if you live with me for a little while, I will teach you how to do something far greater and far better than fishing for fish. I'll teach you how to fish for people, how to fish for men. Whoa, yeah. That's what Jesus posed that question to his disciples for. And I think that there is so much power in that question to actually go to somebody that you look at and you say, you know what, that person has a lot of spiritual maturity. You know what, that person looks a lot what I think Jesus would look like. Not like long hair, kind of homeless, like I'm talking about like spiritually, okay? Like Jesus it does those things and so does that person. I really admire them. I really look up to them. And you go to them and you say, hey, will you mentor me? If you're a sixth grader in this room, maybe that's like an eighth grader. If you're another student, maybe that's one of our adult leaders. Maybe that's somebody you see at church here on Sundays. Maybe that's somebody in your family that you know is a Christian, is really solid in their walk with Jesus. And you go to them. Adult leaders in this room, maybe that's somebody at our church. Again, you're not exempt from it. It's at all times. Somebody is pouring into us, and we are also pouring in to other people. And we go to them, and we pop that question, hey, I really want to grow in my faith. Will you mentor me. See, here's the fourth part of what a disciple is. We're going to circle back. A disciple is somebody who's willing to take that step. When the disciples got popped that question, it says they immediately left their nets, left their livelihood, left all the things they knew, and went to follow Jesus. I think they'd actually heard about Jesus a little bit before because of uh, his connection with John the Baptist and being baptized. So it's not like this was maybe the first time they had ever heard of Jesus, but they were like, that's Jesus, we're going to go follow him. We're going to leave all of our stuff behind, we're going to follow him. And a disciple is someone who's willing to take that step, to either take that step and say, hey, you know what, I want to be mentored, so I'm going to go ask so-and-so, because there's somebody who I think looks a lot like Jesus, and I want to look a lot more like Jesus, I'm going to go ask them, will you mentor me? Maybe it's the other way. Maybe you actually right now, I, would, I think that's amazing, and I think that's very true about some of you, that you have somebody in your life already who is mentoring you, who is teaching you how to be more like Jesus. And that step for you is not to, not to find someone to pour into you, but to find somebody that you can pour into and develop. I think as a middle schooler, totally possible. If it's something you're ready to commit to and to take that step, I think that you can do that. I think that the reason we think about this and the reason that it's in this series is that there is a power of influence, all right? There is a power of influence. I get that, uh, that, mo- that the youngest person in this room is someone who is a sixth grader and is graduating or is going into seventh grade, all right? There's no one in here that's, I know your sister's in a weird spot. She's like half a year, yeah, yeah. But I, I get that. You're like you're already through kind of your first year of middle school and you're going into seventh grade. You got a couple years of middle school and a few years of high school left. I, I did the work, the math with our high schoolers on Sunday night because there they have high school freshmen who are going into 10th grade and they have three years left of high school. And I did the math. I said, hey, if 15 of you were to actually listen to what I'm saying, take it seriously and go for it. If 15 of you were to do that, and at every season, you say, you know what, I'm going to take one person, I'm going to teach them about Jesus, I'm going to hold them accountable, and I'm going to teach them how they can do this to someone else, all right, for every season. So during the summer, you meet up with one person, you teach them about Jesus, you hold them accountable, you teach them how to do the same thing to someone else. In the fall, you and that other person go and find someone new, and for the fall semester, You're finding someone new to to mentor, to disciple, and you're teaching them to do the same thing. And you do that again in the spring, and you flip it over again in the summer, you flip it over again in the fall. I did the math. If 15 of my high schoolers said, yeah, I'll do that, by the time they graduated high school, there will be 15,000 believers in Stowe High School, 
which is not, Stowe High School is only like 1,800 kids, all right? And I said, hey, could you even imagine everyone in Stowe High School being a Christian? And they were like, yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> and I say, I know, right? But you, you see that there is a power in us actually following the commands of Jesus, to actually following through that there is a power of influence by not only being a disciple, but being someone who disciples other people. So listen, that is kind of where we're at. In this room tonight, you are in one of two spots if you're a Christian. You are either in need of somebody to mentor you, to disciple you, to influence you, to teach you, or you already have that, and now it's your turn to go out and mentor someone else, to disciple them, to mentor them, to influence them. That's kind of the two categories of people in here. And at every point in life, as Jeremy taught me as an eighth grader, at every point in life, someone should be pouring into you, and you should be then going out and pouring into someone else. I want you to discuss two questions tonight in your small groups, all right? Two questions. They're really simple, super simple. They are, who in life could be my mentor, could mentor me, could teach me, could influence me for a period of time? And who in my life could I be a mentor to? Who do I know that knows less about Jesus than I do? Who in life has been a Christian for less than me that I could teach? Listen, you might be thinking like, oh, it has to be somebody younger than me. I actually had somebody who's like, I don't know how old he is. I think he's like 20 years older than me. I'm glad he's not in here because he might not be that old. But he's like 20 years older than me. Ask me if I would mentor him. 47. That's really old. Yeah. I'm just kidding. It's not that old, all right? I'm digging myself a hole here. All right. It doesn't necessarily have to be someone younger than you, but maybe for less than you or knows less about Jesus than you do. So I want you to circle up. And let's keep these groups pretty small, all right? Let's say seven people max. If you're in a circle and there's more than seven people, you got to send some people out, all right? Seven people max. These two questions. Who in my life could be my mentor? Who in life could I be a mentor to? And I'm going to give you five minutes, all right? Five minutes to work through these questions together. All right. Hey, I know that wasn't a ton of time, and I would encourage you, like, if you're really getting those conversations going about, man, who could mentor me, or who could I be a mentor to, continue those conversations. Like, actually, you can just stay sitting right where you are, and if we get done and you want to keep talking, that's totally fine with me. But listen here, the big idea, God has called us as Christians to be people of influence, to be influenced by God, and to go out and influence and change the world. Jesus took 12 dudes, one who ended up betraying him, and ch literally changed the world. We are talking about Jesus and his disciples because they actually follow this and they actually change the world. That's what Jesus did with just a small group of dudes, wrecked the world, turned it upside down. And I think that that's the model and the idea that he's given us, that we should go out, we should influence people for him through our platform, through mentoring and discipleship.